Let's begin reading together here in uh, Mark chapter 6. We'll read verses 45 and 46. Again, I'll give you some introduction. We'll move into our study, and then I'll be turning you to Matthew for a while, bringing you back to Mark. So Mark chapter 6, verses 45 and 46. Mark writes, Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, where he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. As we've been seeing here in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus has been ministering in the region of Galilee for some time. Galilee is the northern portion of Israel. Israel is shaped very similarly to uh, the state of California. So in the south, you have Judah. In the center, you have Samaria. And to the north, by the Sea of Galilee, in that region there, just north of the border there of Samaria by Jericho, going a little higher than that, you have what is called the Galilee or the Galilee region. And that's where Jesus has been ministering as we've been uh, looking at this passage. He's been in that area for a little over a year, and he's been ministering there through teaching and performing miracles. During that time, we saw how he had extended his ministry because he had sent out the 12 apostles, and, and we saw how they went out preaching repentance, how they were casting out demons, and that they were healing the sick. And the result was that word about him had even reached the ears of a political official by the name of Herod Antipas. Now, Herod was a politician, and history records that this man feared for his political power. So after Jesus had miraculously fed the huge multitude, there were those who responded by wanting to make him their king. They had hoped that he would overthrow Herod and the Romans and would bring in the, uh, the kingdom of, of, of God on earth, and their hopes uh, were not on eternity. Their hopes were on the material, the, the temporary things, and and that is pointed out in, in John chapter 6, verse 26, because Jesus speaks to them and he says to them, uh, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. So they were looking for the temporary, not the eternal. You see, many of those who had eaten and were satisfied did not understand who Jesus was, even his own men had yet to understand what he was saying and what he was doing. We'll see that in verse 52, where it speaks of them and says they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. So even his own men were not completely aware of who Jesus is. They didn't comprehend yet who he was. We saw this in Mark chapter 4, verse 41, after Jesus had stilled the storm, and they had said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Who can this one be? Well, after what they see Jesus do in this passage, they begin to realize who he is. Matthew will tell us in chapter 14, verse 33, that those who were in the boat came and worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. And so who can this be is answered by truly, you are the Son of God. And so, as we look at this passage, let's begin at verse 45. In verse 45, it says, Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude away. Now, we saw how that Jesus had just fed a great multitude. There were up to fifteen to 20,000 people when you include the women and the children. But now he made his disciples get into the boat and leave. When the scripture says he made them, that word made is a strong word in the original language. It means to compel. It means to force, to even drive, to drive his disciples to get into the boat and leave. So the question has to be asked, why would he make his disciples leave the area and go to Bethsaida? Well, he did it to protect his disciples from being influenced by the political fervor in such a charged environment, even his disciples could be drawn into such a desire. Remember, after Jesus had fed the multitude, many in the crowd wanted to force him to become their king. John 6.15 says, When Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. You see, Jesus didn't want his disciples to be influenced by the world system of rulership. 
He didn't come to establish a system of rule that was patterned after the existing model. He came to bring God's rule to human hearts where humility and service actually prevail. In Matthew's gospel, in chapter 20, verses 27 and 28, Jesus said, whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. God's desire is to rule the human heart. The kingdom of God is not like the kingdoms of men. The kingdom of God is spiritual. In Romans 14, 17, Paul said the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The government cannot make us righteous. The government cannot do anything other than to try and enforce peace. It can't give us peace. And the government cannot give us joy. The Holy Spirit does that. And the kingdom of God is a kingdom of righteousness. And in that kingdom of righteousness, you will have peace and you will have joy because Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. And he, by his Spirit, gives you the joy of the Spirit, you see? And so these people are wanting to force him to be king, and he doesn't want his people to be influenced in that way. You see, if the disciples are influenced by the crowd, it's going to undermine his mission. So to protect them from such an influence, he compels them to go to the other side. Again, in verse 45, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Now, John 6, 17 says they got into the boat and went over the sea to, toward Capernaum, which was on uh, the center of the Sea of Galilee, a little to the west. They were making their way in that direction. So Jesus told his men to go away by way of Bethsaida, but they were going to make their way to the city of Capernaum. And so as he sends them away, verse 46, when he had sent them away, he departed, notice, to the mountain to pray. And so he's praying because he was committed to fulfilling the will of his father. Do you remember how the devil had tempted him? The devil wanted him to wear a crown without a cross. In Matthew 4, 8 and 9, uh, Matthew writes, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. He wanted him to wear a crown without a cross. And Jesus didn't want his men to be influenced in that way. And so there he is praying and he's communing with his father and he's revealing his dependence on him. And that's a model that we ought to also follow ourselves. You see, he prayed and he focused on his purpose. He was remaining steadfast. He was obedient to the Father. He was committed to completing the will of his Father. In Hebrews 10, verse 7, Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. And so there he is praying. Well, verse 47 says, Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Now, when it says when evening came, that is what is called the second evening. Uh, the Jews divided uh, time, the evening, into two sections. There was what was called early evening. It was 3 o'clock to 6. Then there was the second evening, and that would have been 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock. This is the second evening. That's the, the time. So it's between 6 and 9 when this is taking place. The disciples are beginning to make their way towards Capernaum. And as they do so, they're in a little ship. The storm arises. In John 6, 18, the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. But Jesus remained behind on land. And the small boat was proceeding. In John 6, 19, they had rowed three or four miles, but they were not making any headway. And so in verse 48, it says, so he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them. And so he sees them. Notice verse 48. He, they, they are straining. It's about the fourth watch. Now, the fourth watch of the night is the Roman method of calculating time. Romans divided the night into what are called four watches. There was 6 to 9, there was 9 to 12 a.m., 12 to 3 a.m., and then 3 to 6 a.m. This is the fourth watch 
That means it's between 3 and 6 a.m. So by this time, they've been battling the wind and the sea for up to nine hours. They would have been incredibly tired. They would have been frustrated. They would have been alone. The Bible in verse 48 says that the disciples were straining at rowing. That word straining is a Greek word that means they were being tormented or tortured. They were doing everything they could to survive as the storm began to grow more fierce. Matthew 14, 24 says they're in the middle of the sea and they're being tossed by the waves. It's very possible that they were calling on the Lord for help. It's a question that a lot of us will say within ourselves when we go through tough times. Where is God? Where is God when you need him? Where is God when I'm in my need? It's like what it says in Psalm 130, verse 2. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. Where are you? Listen to me. What's happening here is they're continuing their training because they're becoming men of God. They've had a long and difficult day. They need a simple time of rest, but now they're straining at rowing, and they're in a, what would be called a pressing and frightening place. They're in need. The thing that I love about this is this. It's very simple. Notice again in verse 48, he saw them straining. He saw them. Jesus was aware of their situation. His eyes were upon them even when they didn't know it. Like a, a parent will watch their baby, even when the baby doesn't know it. Mama might be there at the park with some friends, and the baby decides to, the little kid, the toddler decides to go and play on a swing or climb up a, a ladder to slide down a slide. And very often the mama, though she may be visiting with her friends, has her eye on that baby. And the baby may think that they're in total control, that everything's going fine, but mama's watching them very closely to make sure that they don't hurt themselves and sometimes make sure that somebody else doesn't hurt them. The mama's eyes are always on the baby. That's the way it works. That's the way it's always worked. And Jesus is doing that now. He's watching those whom he loves. They don't know it, the way that the kid doesn't know that mama or daddy's watching them. You don't know you're being watched, but the eyes of that mama, the eyes of that dad are on that baby. And they even, even as they grow older, they may not know that they're being watched by someone who loves them. When my, my brother Frank, I have a brother named Frank who uh, married his high school sweetheart and then their marriage didn't last. They divorced after, after seven years of marriage. They had two sons. And um, the sons didn't have anything to do very often, if at all, with my mom and my dad, their grandparents. And my mom told me one day, she said, you know, I know where they work, because I guess they were working together at a gas station. And she says, your dad and I will go and we'll park across the street and we'll watch them as they're working. They don't know we're watching them, but we are. And I think that loving parents and even loving grandparents their eyes remain on the child, especially if that child has a need. And though Jesus is there and he's praying and he's communing with his father, the Bible makes it very clear that he saw them and he saw them straining. And so what happens? Well, at the right moment, Jesus came down to their rescue. Like it says in Psalm 34, 15, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are inclined to their cry. So they're tired. They're drained. They're at the end of the rope. And verse 48 says, He came to them walking on the sea. And notice how it says, And would have passed them by. Mark writes from the perspective of the apostles. They thought that he was passing them by. In the storm conditions, dark, it's misty from the wind. They didn't recognize him. Verse 49 says, They supposed it was a ghost. And they cried out. That was a common superstition during that day. The, the people believed that spirits uh, of the night would bring disaster. But Jesus immediately calms their frightened hearts. Notice what he says in verse 50. They all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, shut up. No, he didn't say that. Cowards. He said, be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid, it is I. 
When he says, be of good cheer, that means be courageous, take courage, be brave, don't be afraid. In the midst of the storm, they hear a voice, and it's calming them, it's soothing them. Your situation may be overwhelming, but you can have peace. You need to trust me. He knew what he was about to do, but he first had to bring comfort to them. It was more important to still the storm of their hearts first. In John 16, it says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. <laughs> in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so Jesus is bringing a word of calmness to them. And now I want you to turn to chapter 14 of Matthew with me so I can develop this with something Matthew gives to us that Mark didn't. Matthew chapter 14. I want to show you something in verses 28 through 32. In verse 28 through 32, Matthew chapter 14, Jesus had just said, Be of good cheer, it is I. Don't be afraid. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, no, drown, coward, and shoved his head under the water. <laughs> he said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? <laughs> it's kind of obvious. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Think about that for a minute. Let me develop something with you. We see how Peter's overjoyed. He sees Jesus. Immediately he feels relief. He even has hope. And he even asks Jesus, he says to him, if it's you, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. You see, he knew that it was safer to be with Jesus on the water than for him to remain in the boat. And so in verse 29, Jesus said, come. And Peter came out of the boat. He walked on the water. Peter, come to me. Come to where it's safe. Now, obviously, we don't get specifically asked to walk on water. Obviously, none of us has ever literally been commanded to walk on water. When we go to Israel, and we're on the Sea of Galilee. Every time we've been on that sea, the captain of the little boat that we take We'll say, if anybody feels like taking a walk, feel free. And we obviously all laugh, ha, 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 I've never heard that before. But obviously none of us ever get out of that boat because none of us could do that. So we're not really ever specifically asked to walk on water, are we? We've never been literally with a real demand. We've never been literally been commanded to walk on water. So I want to look at this, and I'm going to find some application for us, because what we need to see in this event is that the walk that Peter takes is a walk that is motivated by faith. And the lesson, well, when we pray and receive directions, we need to step out. It can be God's way of showing us that with God, all things are possible. So you see, he's making his, his way there, he's walking, but... Verses 30 and 31 tells us that he saw that the wind was boisterous. He was afraid. He began to sink. And then he prays the wisest prayer that can be prayed. Lord, save me. That's the prayer that, that does get you saved. It's when you, when you realize that you can't do what you're doing. And it's not just walking on water as a Christian. It, it can be just life itself. Lord, this, la this life that I'm living is so difficult, it's actually impossible. I have no joy. I have no peace. I have an absence of love. I'm concerned about everything all the time. God, I need your help. That's how I got saved. That's how we get saved. Lord, save me. Help me. 
And that was the wisest thing that he could do, is to say, God, I need you. Lord, save me. Psalm 40, verse 17, I'm poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. Oh, my God, do not delay. Well, when he says, Lord, save me, immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. But notice he speaks to him and he says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? It's not that Peter had an absence of faith. It's that his trust didn't go far enough. Peter, your, your faith is incomplete. It didn't bring you all the way to the end. You started out well. You didn't finish well. In Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. You started out well, but you didn't finish well. Notice how it says in verse 32, when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Verse 33 says, those in the boat worshipped him. And so with that said, as the backdrop, I want to give to you applications. I, I've listed six basic applications to our own lives from this miracle. And, and this is what I'll be saying. One, Jesus sent them into a storm. Two, he left them on their own. Three, he watched over them. Four, he came to their aid. Five, he gave them a teaching about faith. And then sixth, he provoked them to worship him. We'll look at those one at a time. The first thing, we see that in verse 22, how it had said in Matthew 14, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. The first thing I want to point to is he made his disciples get into the boat. What's that mean? Well, he sent them into a storm. He sent them into a storm in order that they might learn to trust in him. Here's a, an application for us as Christians. Believers can actually be sent directly into storms to make us dependent upon him. I know there's a lot of TV preachers, I've heard many of them, who seem to give us a guarantee that every day is a good day once you give your heart to Christ. You'll never have another problem, never have another uh, situation that causes you concern. You'll never have another, another bad day in your life, and, and that's just, just not true. And all of us know that if you've been walking with the Lord for any given time. You know that uh, after giving your heart to the Lord, it's almost like there's that amazing peace that he gives you, and, and then it's one thing after another. And, and I discovered a long time ago that, that the, the Lord will use the different circumstances and situations in my life in order to train me up to become a man of God. And, and sometimes he will actually send me someplace that I didn't even want to go. Peace and prosperity are often the greatest pitfalls a believer can experience because faith is best developed, matured, and refined in what has been called the furnace of adversity. In Psalm 66, 10 through 12, for you, O God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You've caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. But you brought us out to rich fulfillment. You led us into a place where everything we depended upon was stripped away from us so that the only thing left that I could do was trust you. Do you want to grow? Do you want to be a mature Christian? Some of you are thinking, not now. If you put it that way. No, you, every one of you, if you drive a car, Every one of you who drives a car that has had various stress tests, engines, different parts, they go through stress tests. Why is that? They want to see at what point they'll break so they can improve it or at least let you know this is as far as you should go with this. Everything that you use goes through various tests. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I be put in a place where I am helpless and hopeless and then finally I realize I should cast my care on the Lord because... It's at that place when I find my own weakness that I discover his incredible strength. So Jesus sent him into the storm. Maybe some of you are in a storm right now. I know some of you are going through a real tough time, 
a real tough time. And you're thinking, Lord, I don't even know. Why celebrate Christmas? I don't have joy in my heart. What's going on? It feels like so much has been stripped from me. I feel so alone. I feel helpless. I feel weak. Not every one of you. Thank God for those of us who aren't perhaps in that. But some of us are. And somebody watching online is, most definitely. You ever stop to think that the Lord allowed you to go and actually sent you into that place? so he could break you and make you more like him? Have you ever said, God, I want to be like you? How do you think that takes place? Remember Isaiah 53, he is the wounded healer. He was, he was wounded for us. This is one who had sympathy for all of his brethren. He knew what it was like to be tempted, yet without sin. This is one who went through affliction for us. What makes me think that I'm going to be avoiding that in my life? And I've discovered that the deeper pain I've experienced has deepened me as a believer in him. When I've been at my lowest, he's always had his hand underneath me to raise me up. I've discovered that, and these men need to learn the same thing. He made his disciples get into the boat. The second thing is he left them alone. He left them alone that he might teach them that they really are never alone. You see, we walk by faith and not by sight. And though he has left them alone, in reality, they're never out of his sight. In Job 36, verse 7, it says, He does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous. He was watching them. And then a third thing we saw in Mark 6, 48, how he saw them straining at rowing. Matthew 14, 24 says that, they were being tossed by the waves. They're straining and being tossed. While they were concentrating on rowing, he was concentrating on them. And they needed to, to learn that God is always vigilant and always concerned for them. In Psalm 121, 3 and 4, he will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. He knows what you're going through. He was watching them. They weren't out of his sight. They needed to learn that he's there, that he's concentrating on them, vigilant for them, concerned about them. And then fourth, he came to their aid at the right time. He didn't leave them in the midst of the struggle. He came to their aid at the right moment. Psalm 18, verses 1 and 2, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. He came to their aid. He didn't leave them in their struggle. And then a fifth thing, he revealed to them how great he was. It says in Matthew 14, 32, when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. In John 6, 21, they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. The storm ceased, and they saw that they were near land. Psalm 107, verses 28 through 30, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. And then sixth, he taught them that he was much more than they thought he was. They received a deeper understanding of who he was. They discovered this is the Lord of creation. Mark 6, 6 51, they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure, and they marveled. In Matthew 14, 33, those who were in the boat came, and they worshipped him. Have you been in a storm? Have you been in a storm? Have you been in that place where you thought there's no hope? That everything that you thought your life would be and end up, have you ever had somebody tell you it's not going to end that way? Have you ever been in the place where Somebody said all the things that you think and thought and planned and prayed for and hoped for and expected. Well, those things aren't going to take place. You've been there. Many of us have. 
I don't remember exactly when it was. Some of you have heard this story before. Let me share it now because this is one of those times where I was sent into a storm. I've been in many storms over the years. This uh, next week, next week, uh, I celebrate my 51st anniversary of coming to faith in Jesus Christ. I've been in a lot of storms. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of storms. If you haven't been in a storm, you, you aren't married. No, I, I've... <laughs> And you don't have children. I've been in a lot of storms. And so my wife Marie and I went to Florida. I don't remember exactly when it was. About 13 years or so ago. And while we were there on our flight, as we were flying, I turned to Marie and I said, there's something going on in my body I can feel something. Something's going on inside of me. And then I got quiet for a moment. We arrived and we get to the Miami area and we go to the place that we're going to be, that I was going to teach. I was going to teach a Wednesday night Bible study and then I was going to be teaching a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday married couples conference. And so we were gone for a few days and all, and, and we'd been to Miami before, and we'd gone to a Dunkin' Donuts for communion. No, we had gone to a Dunkin' Donuts, and uh, they had a particular coffee there that they sold at this Miami place that I thought they had called Cuban coffee. I was wrong. So I, I like Cuban coffee, this particular coffee. So I tell my girl, I tell my wife, honey, I'd like a Cuban coffee. You know, well, she brings me two. And they were big cups of Cuban coffee. I'm looking at this. It's really a very strong espresso is what it is. This isn't what I was expecting. I was expecting something that they called Cuban, which was a cappuccino. These are two good size, good size cups. And when I drink espresso, I'm not one of these guys who sip with my little pinky up like that. I don't do that. I do bang. <laughs> it's over, John. You've seen me do that. Boom. That's how I drink it. Like, boom. Then you chew the coffee grounds. You know, that's what men do. Arr. But anyway, so I, I drank both of them not realizing some Cubans, I have Cubans in this church, you know where I'm going with this. It was so strong. Well, I go out to teach. I lost my memory. I was hospitalized for four days because I didn't know I had high blood pressure. And this coffee brought me into a state where my blood pressure, what happened is this, I should tell you what happened. I gave the study. Now, Marie, I've, I'd lost my memory before. I'd, I'd been having trouble with it before. I didn't know what it was. So what had happened is I gave the study, but Marie knew that I had lost my memory because what happened is I went directly to reading my notes and I read them a second time. She knew something happened. So at the end, I gave an invitation. People got saved. I went down and prayed with people. Marie came up the aisle to me, put her arm in my arm, and, and I looked at her and I said, I don't know where I am. She was the only person I knew and I, under, I recognized. I don't know where I'm at, get me out of here. I had completely lost my memory. They took me into the back room, called a paramedic. He took my blood pressure, it was over 200, and they said, he's gonna have a stroke. They put me in an ambulance. I don't, I remember kind of being in an ambulance took me to a hospital, Dade County, and uh, they questioned me. I didn't know, I didn't, I couldn't answer questions. They put me in a hospital bed, and I, I woke up about three in the morning, and I looked down next to me on my bed. They had brought a cot, and my girl, my wife, was laying in that cot. She couldn't leave me. She was just laying there next to me. For four days, I was hospitalized. So I came home, 
And I thought, I don't know what's going on. And so I have to go to these doctor's appointments and they put me in, in those little, that little tube there, and I got a PET scan and, and an MRI and so many different, I don't even remember what they, all of them, there were so many. And then I had to go to a neuropsychologist because they wanted to check my brain. And the neuropsychologist and I were sitting, and uh, sit, I was sitting across from her after going through all of these tests. And, and I said, you need to tell me in very direct terms or I won't hear you what you think. What is my prognosis according to your expertise? I'd like to know. She says to me, you're going to lose your memory in seven years. You see, the nurse had come in, one of the nurses had come into the room and in front of me told my wife, oh, he's got dementia. And when she said that, Marie turned and looked at me because she knew what I would do with that. And I looked at her. The nurse walked out and I'll, I, I said, put me in a home. I don't want you taking care of me. I won't even recognize you. Put me in a home. I don't want to burden you. My life was gone. It's gone. A minister relies on his memory. I rely on my memory. Without a memory, what am I going to do? So the lady says, you've got dementia. You've got, you've got, you have seven years. I was 58 at the time. You've got seven years. So I look at my wife, and I said, take care of the bill, baby. And I went and sat in the car, put my hand 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock. Some of you have done that. 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and you just, I held on to that, and I said, Jesus, what am I going to do? I was hoping to be able to spend time with the, my girl, enjoy my grandchildren. My life has just ended. I had to go and have some PET scans. Some of you in the medical profession know what those are. And so I spoke to the doctor, the neurologist who did that, and he said, you have calcification on your left and right temporal lobe. Not only that, I found out I had glaucoma. Not only that, I found out I had diabetes. One thing after another, at the, it was just like a storm. One after another, after another. So Marie and I left for a week or so. We had set up a, a church getaway to, to Maui. We used to take the church to Maui. And I said, I'm going to go. I've got to get away. I've got to just get my... I've got I to gotta come to grips with this because... I don't, know what, I don't know what I'm going to do. Jesus, you're going to have to help me. Brought my kids into the back room before he left, and I told them, I said, you know, um, Marie had said, well, he's going to, and I said, no, Mama, don't do that. I said, this is what the doctor actually said. And I told them the news. I didn't tell the church anything. Sometimes the church isn't very... Gracious to those who were sick. So I didn't say anything. And we took it to the Lord, which is what you do, right? And we started walking on water. It was safer with Jesus than it was in the boat. And I said, God, if it's you, tell me to come. And he said, come. So I did. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I have to make plans. How am I going to take care of my girl, my kids? A righteous man leaves an inheritance for his children and his children's children. What am I going to do for my family? Because I won't leave them without being cared for. And I started making decisions and doing things. 
And in preparing, the doctor said, I want to see you. I didn't want to go see him, but I did. And we went to see the doctor. I'll, ne I'll never forget the neurologist as I sat there. And I don't know why doctors like to make you wait when you have an 8 o'clock, but <laughs> around 9 o'clock we're inside his office. And this is what he says to me. He's the one who had said I had calcification. He kind of like looks at me and then shakes his head like this. And this, this is three or four weeks or so later. I don't know, he goes. Sometimes we just make mistakes. There's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> so I hit him. <laughs> Something's wrong with you. Why did I tell you that story? I tell you that story because sometimes people think that people like me just tell you, hey, you can do it, but we don't go through things. Sometimes people think that people like me play golf five days out of the week and then teach two days out of the week. But I'm in the same boat you are in. My life is the same as yours. We go through the pains and the sorrows and the griefs and the losses the disappointments, the rejections, the judgment, we go through it too. I've been walking on water for many years, and I can tell you, he will not let you drown. I can tell you, he'll say, come with me. I can tell you that, because he does, because he does. And you may right now be sinking, saying, God, save me. And Jesus is pulling you back out even right now. And he's saying, oh, you of little faith, why are you doubting? What makes you think I will not save you? What makes you think I will not care for you? Don't you know how much I love you? Don't you know? That's what keeps me going. I'm sorry for the emotion. This is real to me. I've been there. I live there. That's where I live. That's my address. Walk on Water Lane. That's my life. Because Jesus, I can't do this without you. I can't be a good man without you. I can't be a good dad without you. I can't be a good father. I can't be a good husband. I can't be a good grandfather. I can't be a good friend. I can't be anything. For without you, I can do nothing. But with you, I can do all things. And that's what Jesus teaches us. So how does it work? You worship him. That's what the men did. He, there's, I can almost picture, though, this is my imagination and not scripture, but I wonder if perhaps Jesus might have placed his hand on on the apostle Peter's shoulder and, and brought him back with his strength, walked him back to that boat. He had these other guys who were thinking, oh man, he almost drowned. Yeah, but he got out of the boat and took a walk. There are always people who will tell you what you're doing wrong when you're walking on water and they're in a boat. They're not stepping out. They're not doing anything. They're just sitting there eating their French fries saying, you don't do it right. Take the chance, step out, walk on water, watch what God will do. And when Jesus walks them back to the boat, they worshiped him. They said, what manner of man is this? And that's why I worship him, because he's the one who pulls me out. He's the one who makes water as, as hard as concrete and walks me back to a place of safety. That's what the God that we worship does for us. And that's the God that I worship. Now, let me close real quickly. I told you I was going to take you to the end of the chapter. You may be saying, oh, really? Yes. Let's go back to chapter 6. And we'll close with just a few closing words here. In verse 52, it said, They had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. He had multiplied fish and he had multiplied the bread. He had walked on water. But now they're beginning to see who he is. So, verse 53, when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and anchored there. 
And when they came out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him, ran through that whole surrounding region, and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he entered into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. We'll close very quickly by just saying this. They arrive in a place called Gennesaret, which if you were looking at a map, it's the Sea of Galilee. It's a little northwest of uh, Capernaum. And they're making their way to the city of Capernaum. There's no synagogue or building large enough to contain these multitudes. And because of this, he's ministering to the people in an open-air meeting. And so they, become to, they begin to come. They're bringing people and all. And a pattern has been established. They're, they're coming to Jesus in droves. And they carried the sick to him. And others just tried to touch the hem of his garment. Like the, the men who had carried their friend to Jesus and had opened up that roof and dropped him before him. Or the woman who had the issue of blood, this is taking place. They're seizing an unexpected opportunity. They're not about to let this moment pass by without receiving from him, like it says in Isaiah 55, 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Now, why are they bringing these people? What, what is drawing them? What's drawing them to him is his compassion and his love. That's a beautiful and very attractive thing. Somebody once said, a man's intelligence may win a person's mind. His force of will may compel their obedience. His personality may win their affection. His eloquence may gain their admiration. His courage may inspire their loyalty. But only love will win their souls. And they could see that Jesus loved them. They brought those that they loved to Jesus, that he might touch them. And we ought to do the same. We ought to bring those whom we love to hear of Jesus, that he might touch their lives. You see, the invitation is still open. In this season, we have great opportunity. America still hasn't forgotten that there's such a thing as Christmas. And a lot of Americans still will go to a church service because that's what you do around Christmas. Invite your friends. Invite your family. Perhaps they'll come to know Jesus. In Revelation twenty two seventeen 17 says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. Whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. People can still come and take of that free life, free water of life, that comes through Jesus Christ. Why did they bring their friends and family? Because Jesus is loving, compassionate, and available. He was then, and he still is today. Our Father, we ask that you would work in our hearts.